um, may very well um, help us better understand um, the Paleolithic, but the research at some of these sites is in its infancy. Right, so we are left with um, this kind of lingering question mark uh, in the lower Paleolithic record of the Southern Caucasus. Um, and we have many sites that might fit into this period, but it's kind of unclear on how exactly they fit here. Right? And this leaves me with a number of questions that I'm interested in specifically, such as the nature of the overall Acheulean in this region, right? What, um, how late Acheulean sites might connect with this transition we see at Norgari, um, how some of these transitional technologies begin to manifest, right? And even how the sequences of technology here compare to other regions that are better studied. And I really think that Hottis One can help us better understand and contextualize the Acheulean in this region. Right, and thereby also help us better understand the transition that we later see at Norgari One. Right. So turning to the site of Hattus itself, right? Hattus is, uh, one is located on the Southern slope of Mount Hattus. Um, it was originally discovered in the 1980s um, and excavated with a small two by two test pit, right? Uh, Unfortunately, it's never been published in full from those original excavations. What I've put up on the screen here is kind of the most comprehensive discussion of the site that's been published in uh, 1986. Uh, and also unfortunately, the majority of over 2000 artifacts from this excavation are lost to time. Uh, we have a handful of them, but not very many. So, our team revisited Hottis One um, in 2016 briefly and in 2017 a little bit more extensively um, in which we located the original test unit, cleaned it and excavated back the Western wall by about half a meter. In doing so, right, we were able to establish the stratigraphy here in which we find seven stratigraphic units, right? which are colluvial deposits, um, two through seven here, overlaying a pyroclastic flow, which is one and one A um, here on this figure, right? Most of the archeology span comes from these colluvial deposits, especially unit number two. And we were not able to recover any samples suitable for direct chronometric dating, unfortunately, but there are a few things that help us restrict the age of the site. Um, and I'll return to that a little later. But in total, um, we recovered 319 lithic artifacts um, and only lithic artifacts from the site. Um, and then I include a further 13 artifacts from the original excavation in my analyses. So just a quick uh, note on the methods for the results I'm going to discuss. Um, first, all of our obsidian artifacts were sourced by Ellery Fromm using PXRF, right? Um, and along with more traditional modes of lithic analyses that I used, I also 3D scanned the assemblages and used most of these scans in all of my subsequent analyses, um, including the WEEP method for understanding hand axe production, uh, using board's original metrics for looking at hand axe shape and even simple landmark based geometric morphometrics. Um, so turning to the results from the site, uh, let's talk first about toolstone. Um, and we have mostly obsidian here with just a few pieces of the site. Um, and perhaps unsurprisingly, when these were PXRFs, um, they all come from the hottest, all of the obsidian pieces anyway, come from the hottest location itself, from the volcano, right? Um, and almost all of these obsidian pieces come from um, the most proximate source to the site, um, Hattis Alpha, here in this aerial view in red, with a very small component, six pieces total, coming from Hattis Gamma, which is in green on this aerial view. So turning to the assemblage composition, right? There's little change from top to bottom of the section here. So it's all seems to be broadly the same technology. 
And that is pretty much Leidischulian, not unlike what you see in Leidischulian and Ashulo Yabrudian sites in the Levant, um, some of the undated Georgian sites, and even some of the newer sites popping up in the Arabian Peninsula. And I won't go too much into this, um, but the composition of the assemblage fits many criteria for inclusion in what's called the large flake Acheulean, um, with a focus on large flakes um, over 10 centimeters in size. Um, but with the most notable exception to this categorization being the use of high quality toolstone at Hottest One. Um, so we have plenty of, of different kind of technologies present at the site, and I won't go into all of them, um, but I'll, I'll draw your attention to a few things here. Uh, the first is the use of large flakes as cores is the most common core technology we see, right? This is followed by kind of more amorphous multi-platform core technology, right? Things that are pretty unsurprising given um, it's thought that this is a latest Shulian site. Right. A few other things I want to bring your attention to. Um, first, uh, here at the top of the figure, we have the presence of simple prepared cores at the site in very low quantity, but we have them. Um, and again, these are those kind of cores that approach Lavawa technology um, of the Middle Paleolithic, but they're less prepared and they don't fit all of these diagnostic criteria we use for Lavawa. Um, the second thing here I want to draw your attention to at the bottom of the figure are the retouch tools. Um, and these are mostly made on very thick, large blanks and have very steep retouch, uh, similar to what you see in Kina or semi-Kina types. Um, and both of these cores and these, these flake types are very similar to what we have at Norgari one. Um, and also at Laetitia context in the Levant, right? So further making those connections. Uh, turning to the large cutting tools at the site, the, the hand axes, some of the traditional metrics used place these into two shape categories, mostly ovoid and chordate, right? With one outlier. Right. These placements are confirmed with the landmark geometric morphometrics, right? We have PCA results um, that also put these in these same groups and they're statistically um, different in shape. So this, I, to me, this begs a question as to what would be driving this difference in shape, right? It's certainly not raw material differences. Um, many people tend to point to things like reduction um, for explaining differences in hand axe shape, um, but we have a metric that shows that's not the case for this. So we can turn to production differences, um, specifically using the WEEP method. Um, and here we have a linear discriminant analysis plot um, that shows us that these, based on their production uh, methods, separate into the same shape groups, chordates and ovoids, um, and that these differences are significant um, and that they're driven essentially by the application of different shaping strategies um, at the distal end of these implements and the depth of removals along the entire uh, implement. Um, one last comment on these large cutting tools. Uh, there are a number of these that end their use life with these large preferential core-like removals here highlighted in red, which is fairly similar to what we have at Norgari One and actually a lot of late Acheulean sites um, across parts of Eurasia, right? So further making those connections to what's happening later at the transitional site. So to get back to that chronology that I mentioned earlier um, that I said I'd come back to, since we don't have direct chronometric dates, right? Um, there are a few things that help us restrict the age range of the site. And the first is the fact that the hottest volcano itself um, is dated the formation of that volcano to around 700,000 based on dating of the lower uh, rhyolite facies. Um, we also have a date for the formation of the obsidian flows on the mountain um, that are then used for the creation of artifacts. But uh, there are a few issues with this date of 480,000 um, that make me out of caution instead use 
uh, both of these early dates kind of in tandem um, as the, the older possible date of the site. Uh, and then we can say the site seems to be technologically older than what we see happening at the transitional site of Norgari 1, um, that 9E locus that's been published on, uh, but we can't say that necessarily for sure. Um, so to quickly summarize the site, right, it's late Acheulean in character. It is the large flake Acheulean, it appears, but a regional variant of that based on the accessibility of quality toolstone. Right? We see a continuum of shaping strategies for the production of the tools here um, that explain why certain tools are produced into the shapes they are. Uh, we see broad similarities to the Levantine late Acheulean among other places. Um, and we also have broad similarities to Norgari 1. Uh, but it seems like this site itself has earlier stages of the same technological radiation or experimentation with prepared core technology that we see later become fixed at Norgari. And we can say that the site is uh, younger than 700 or 480,000 and could very likely predate Norgari 1. And to just briefly talk about how this fits into my dissertation work, um, my dissertation work overall aims to understand technological variability and change in both the Southern Caucasus and the United Kingdom um, to better understand the kind of chronological and geographical variability in the onset of Middle Paleolithic behavior. Right, looking at how it presents itself in these different places, looking at the relationships between things like hand axes, prepared cores, and Lavawa proper, and also asking the simple question of why Lavawa technology. Right. Um, and very, very briefly, I also want to very quickly say there is a number of un ongoing projects um, that are also aiming to kind of fill in this question mark period in the lower Paleolithic record of the Southern Caucasus. Um, these are two that uh, I'm involved with, lucky enough to be involved with. These are leaky funded projects run by Dan Adler, Jenny Sheriff, Keith Wilkinson, and Phil Globerman. Um, and they also aim to help us better understand the lower Paleolithic, but they're really looking from the other end of everything um, of that question mark period uh, from what Hottis tells us, right? It's looking at the early Pleistocene and some of these pre acheulean core and flake technologies. So it would be really exciting to see where these projects go. Um, and with that, there's a number of people um, that always have to be thanked for these types of projects because they're so collaborative. Um, but I really always like to thank the Armenian communities that we live with and work with every year when we go, because honestly, without them, there's absolutely no way we could perform this type of research that we do. Uh, and with that, um, I am done. Thank you, guys. So, um, you mentioned that you you basically got these two, well, not, not end members, but these two different types of um, kind of hand axe production occurring at Hattis. And you were talking about the difference sort of driven by, you know, the, the, the technique the hominins are using to essentially, you know, produce the, the hand axes. And um, why do you think, or could you hypothesize why you're actually getting these different production techniques at the same site? Can you link that to behavior in any way? Could you massively speculate about this? Yeah, um, so I, I think that's a good question. And I, I really held back in our publication about uh, going too much out on a limb on this because, right, we are looking at essentially these palimpsests um, of, of behavior. Um, and many of the hand axes come from the collapsed profile at the site. So we can't really directly know exactly what even uh, part of the profile they came from originally. Um, but it, it very well could even be that we're looking at just different occupations of the site and different groups with different production techniques. Um, that's quite a possibility. Um, it could be that essentially you're applying different production techniques to provide different shaped tools that have different functions. Um, it's really hard to say without better context at the site. And that's one thing that's really unfortunate about the site is we just don't have great context oh, we you know we have what we have you've been there it's not it's not the prettiest thing to excavate 
no no it's not but i mean the, the surrounding area is pretty the actual side. yeah the surrounding area it's a beautiful view that's so good <laughs> uh, um yeah i can't see any i have another question then um so the i know you didn't kind of talk about this but the obsidian sourcing that's been undertaken at norgeri by ellery from suggests that the norgeri hominins are maybe using a wider range of obsidian sources so you know you showed the the, the data from hattis and the the hattis hominins were essentially you know snatch and grab from an, an outcrop very close to the site but we know that these later Acheulean hominins from Norgeri were kind of wandering around the landscape a little bit more. And again, I, I wondered if you could sort of speculate on why you think that might be the case. Yeah, um, I mean, I think one thing just to consider is, is the placement of the sites themselves, since right, Norgeri isn't directly on an obsidian source. So there, there's a requirement for movement um, for, I mean, even if it's just into the, the gorge itself to pick up the, the cobbles, since we know that these flows ex expand, especially from places like Katanasar. Um, but I, I, again, it's difficult to say because this is a, a small sample of a site. So it's possible that they're, they are bringing other, other toolstone with them as they travel the landscape. But really, while they're at the site, it makes the most sense to use what's directly available, this high quality obsidian. And since there's really no difference in the quality of these obsidians, right? Like, why, why, would, you, why would you bother? Um, I think if we were to have those original 2000 artifacts, you might see some other sources in very low quantity. It's also just very possible that as we move towards the, the Middle Paleolithic, um, and I think this might be right, Ellery's answer um, to this question is that, right, hominin ranges start expanding um, as you start seeing these changes in technology that might um, help with mobile, right? Some people have suggested Lovawa technologies is, are more of a mobile toolkit for opening and expanding uh, hominin ranges. So that very might well play a, a role in why hominins um, at at Norgeri specifically have this wider catchment area for their toolstone. They're simply moving more and that's shown through potentially their technology and what sources they're using. Yeah, it's, it's, it's um, really like interesting to just see, you know, compare two sites. They're actually geographically quite close. Obviously temporally, we're not, we're not sure of, but um, you know, that you've got these, these quite kind of different behaviors and well potentially different behaviors and, and different assemblages um in two yeah. areas that are so close yeah. oh, and i think oh, sorry. I, I do i do think that um right we need more hottest like sites with with the same type of of quality of information in terms of sourcing to really make kind of big claims about these changes in in hominin mobility and catchment areas because right these are just two data points um, that could very well be uh, exceptions to the rule. Yeah, yeah, and that's the thing. And that, I think that's one of the, the probably difficulties of working in the Paleolithic in, in the Caucasus is that we have these fantastic sites, but a lot of them are a nightmare today. You know, we're, we're looking at sites that are very old and they, um, you know, they, they, they stretch sort of beyond radiocarbon ages and like uranium thorium ages. So we're, we're having to rely on on kind of less independent dating methods, which is, you know, sometimes problematic, but hopefully, you know, we, should, we might be able to resolve that in the future, <laughs> fingers crossed anyway. Hopefully. Right. Yeah. Um, so have you ever had a chance to examine, I'm going to pronounce this wrong, I'm really sorry, Gugub Baba Hill, because it is a lower Paleolithic area in Eastern Turkey, so it could be a good, um, good material for comparison. Um, so the, the site name doesn't particularly um, ring a bell. Um, <laughs> I would pronounce it just as poorly. Uh, but um, I do know from, from a, all of the, the, the Turkish, kind of Eastern Turkish um, lower Paleolithic sites, a lot of them tend to be right surface uh, scatters or or right, really kind of limited subsurface deposits. Um, there are a few better examples um, kind of in, 
in Western Turkey, but those might have less of um, significance for our understanding of what's happening necessarily in the Southern Caucasus. Uh, but I do think, right, all of these sites, whether they have good context or, or, or good dates or, or not are important um, comparison points especially as we start to build the techno typological sequence so we can better understand how all this all fits together. Um, but for this comparisons in, in the published paper on this site, I tried to look more at very well dated contexts for comparison, just so we can kind of maybe better understand where Hottis fits into that, that question mark. But um, I do think all, all of these sites are, are good points of comparison. Mm. Yeah, definitely. Um, and it probably, probably kind of follows on to a point that you made at the start of your talk, Jason, that a lot of the sites, you know, there's, 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 there's dozens of lower Paleolithic sites all across, you know, Armenia and Georgia and Azerbaijan, but they're, they're not necessarily, well, they haven't been published, you know, in Western literature or they haven't been, you know, there's, there's reports of them that are in a sort of you know a, a monograph somewhere so there's definitely lots of sites for comparison it's just you know being able yeah. to access the material and the information yeah. about these sites is sometimes difficult from from our point of view yeah ah, awesome well thanks for that um okay moving on to dominic if he's ready now um so i'll introduce our next speaker so our next speaker is dominic rogel he's a phd student working in the department of archaeology at the hebrew university of jerusalem and Dominic's research is focused on using herptofauna and small mammalian remains to understand environmental change and hominin behaviours in the Southern Caucasus during the Middle Paleolithic. Um, Dominic's um, in the first, second year of your PhD now, and this work is actually building upon his master's thesis, which was focused on using faunal remains and sedimentology to reconstruct past environments in the Middle Paleolithic cave site, um, Ararat 1, located in the Ararat Depression in Armenia. Uh, today, Dominic will talk about some of the first results and future prospects for his PhD research, focusing on some of the faunal assemblages from late Middle Paleolithic sites in Armenia. Uh, Dominic, are you happy to share your screen? Thank you, Jenny, for the introduction. I hope you can see my presentation. So uh, thank you for having me, first of all, and thank you to everyone who is joining us today. Um, as Jenny already said, I will talk about the microfauna record of Armenia and how we can use the information um, to <clears throat> speak about human environment dynamics. Um, since I am part of a bigger project, I want to um, acknowledge the, the work of everyone who whoever worked there or is still working there. So Jenny, you're in here as well. <laughs> so thank you for that. Um, and that being said, um, let's move on. So microfauna um, is a very, or is considered to be a very good proxy in order to reconstruct paleo environment. Um, but unfortunately, it's not really sure often what it include. So when I use the term microfauna, what kind of animals I include. So I just put some slides in to show you what I exactly mean with that. So um, Jenny already said I will include small mammalians, uh, which is a broad variety of different uh, types of animals from squirrels to, to moles and hedgehogs. Um, I also include rabbit-like animals, and if I find them, there will be some bats maybe as well. Um, and then since there was usually a lack of it, I will combine everything with happy to fauna. Um, so we have frogs and toads and snakes, reptiles, everything, um, in order to, to strengthen the basis of using small animals um, as environmental proxy. Uh, that being said, just a short overview of where we actually are. So you can see here the Southern Caucasus regions uh, or the Armenian highlands, depending on which terminology you use. Um, strongly influenced by the Black Sea and Caspian Sea in um, uh, climate wise. Um, it covers a, a range of uh, 29,600 square uh, meters. And um, we have 
a broad variety of en um, environmental niches today, a lot of vegetation changing across short distances, uh, which is also related to uh, uh, precipitation ranging between 200 millimeters in the south, where we have a semi-desert environment, to uh, up to 600 millimeters in forested areas. And also the geology is just diverse enough. Um, so the, the time period we, as the project, were interested in uh, between MI7 and 2. And as you can see on the map, we already have um, a number of sites in Armenia and Georgia, but they are usually concentrated um, in a very narrow area, like here in Georgia and then around the Hrostan River Valley in Armenia. So what we did, we decided to move out of those hotspots and focus on three different sites I will discuss or present to you today, which is uh, Kalaban 2, Hof 1, and then as Jenny already said, my master thesis cave Arad 1 in the south. Um, Kalaban 2 is a paleolithic open air site uh, at an elevation of 1,640 meters. It's in, on this triangular plateau um, between the Dani River and the Barapat uh, River. And in total, we have four different trenches, uh, which all produce microfauna animal uh, elements. And um, I inherited this uh, sign from Dr. Monica Knuhl from the Winchester University. And right now I can uh, give you already some animals we have. So we have some hamsters here. Um, uh, 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 and other um, stepic or grassland adapted animals like um, the European water vole or the shrews and even an alpine marmot. So since I'm still working on the assemblage itself, um, I cannot say a lot about the hepatofauna yet, um, but it, what I can say, it looks like from all the four trenches, that there are differences in accumulation. So we think that in trench four, uh, which produced a lot of um, anatomically, oh, sorry, some sound outside, uh, a lot of hamsters from trench four and a lot of other animals from the other three trenches, uh, which died either in the barrow or it shows heavily digested marks. So they were accumulated by predators. Um, so, yeah, for now it's just a taxonomic list. What it actually says about the environment, we will we will discuss later a bit. Um, so we have um, 13 sedimentological units in Calaban two, and in general the site dates between 60,000 and 4, 000, uh, 45 thousand years. Um, uh, as I said it will change uh, in the other sites. It's an open air site. Now it's in the forested mountains of North, uh, North Armenia. The question will be, um, was it the same in the past? Um, I already discussed the different depositional agents we have. Um, my future research will uh, also address if that's actually true, how can we better identify um, the agents we're dealing with? And um, yeah, the focus will be the taphonomic studies and the environmental reconstruction. Um, after we finished the excavations in Calaban, I think it was 2019, uh, so right before COVID, um, uh, we moved to the south to the Ararat Depression, my master site, which is a cave site. So, not exactly the same context as Calaban 2, it's a limestone. A karstic cave um, in a quite tectonic area. Um, as you can see here, I hope you see my mouse, it's on the slope of a mountain overlooking not only the semi-arid environment here, but also a floodplain from the Arax River. And um, since I worked on the sedimentology as well, we saw um, a coarse fine sill and angular limestone uh, 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 matrix. And it was just very interesting because we, we actually took a lot of samples as well for dating and tephra. Um, 
and we produce quite a diverse assemblage of microfauna. So even though you might not be familiar with all the, the Latin names here, we have um, quite a large group of animals that are more adapted to an arid uh, or semi-arid environment, including the pika, the ground squirrel, or the jaguar. Um, then we have a smaller group of animals like the water vowel uh, and the shrews, which are more uh, connected usually to a wetter environment. And then we have moles and hedgehogs uh, and mice, uh, which usually are in a more temperate environment. So we already see there is some, something going on with different uh, environments or at least animals that would prefer different environments. And for the first time, um, I was able to work on happy to fauna. So also here we have different types of snakes um, and legless lizard. We have the Caucasian agama and then quite a lot of the Eurasian green toad, um, which is uh, apparently quite different from the uh, European version, uh, Viridis. But anyway, so I, for now I haven't, um, worked on what they mean for my environment and how it connects or, or maybe not connects to um, the mammals I, I saw. Um, so um, the dating of the cave is between 45 and 33, which uh, connects very well to Calavan II. And um, we also see activity of possibly a hyena um, and obviously hominin activity as well. Um, I already addressed the mostly landscape we see, um, which we have to test how it works with the hepatofauna. Um, this as well will be part of a taphonomical study. And um, to link better all the sites I'm talking about, and especially to other sites that are already known, uh, we need to refine the chronology um, since, um, but other people are better with it to talk about since it looks like a middle Paleolithic site and not an upper Paleolithic site, even though the date, the, the date fits to it. Um, and since we are very ambitious people, we added a third uh, site to it, um, which is also in the north, uh, not too far from Calavan II. It's um, the high elevation, cave site of Hof 1. Um, it's on an elevation of 2,040 meters. And um, it's also a site I inherited from the team of Kinhasi. And uh, Leo Weisbrot um, worked on the microfauna already, uh, but he was um, focused on only the dental elements of the mammalians, uh, which turns out to be even more diverse than what I had in Arara to begin with. Um, I added um, some hepatofauna to it, um, which needs to be um, studied in more detail. The, what's interesting here is uh, Hofquan in the north is so high up that nowadays it is above the tree line. And uh, when we look at the mammalians that were already identified, um, we see the three animals here, it's the dormouse, the Caucasian squirrel, and then the Eurasian snowball. And especially the snowball actually prefers high elevation and usually lives above the tree line. So um, that's rather interesting since half one also dates similarly to the other two sides. Um, and we can test how tree lines shifted and how it made uh, maybe affect uh, hominin behavior um, or what it implications has on the, the climate itself. Um, we see a more grassland and forest adapted uh, uh, assemblage. And um, yeah, as I said, there is a lot to do about reconstructing the environment and the taphonomy still. But at least I have a very broad assemblage of three different sites. So why are we all doing this? Um, obviously, uh, learning about the environment 
is helpful on one hand, but eventually we want to connect it, it to the hominin behavior. So three sites dating more or less the same in three different areas across uh, three different elevations. Um, what does it do in, with, with the humans? How will it used and what effect has the climate since I already said nowadays it's so diverse and um, yeah, so here you can see how drastic the, the shifts in the relief of those 160 kilometers is, which correct me if I'm wrong afterwards, uh, originates from the obsidian tracking Ellery from did for us as well. Um, so we know there is uh, high mobility going on um, in the population of humans we have in, in this time period. And what I'm concerned about now is how to compare those three locations. So not only is this, is it um, on different elevations, but also very different nowadays in the environment, like between forest and semi-arid. Um, then at least one of them, Calaban 2, is an open air site and not a cave site. So those are all questions I have to keep in mind when we talk about um, site formation, like um, who accumulated it and taphonomic processes after it was deposited. So we came up with a, with a plan together with our colleagues in um, Armenia right now. Um, so we started to sample elements, um, sorry, specimens around those locations. So um, mammalians and uh, hepatofauna to understand the current biodiversity, first of all. So what is there now? Um, which will also include um, some DNA studies. Then we try to understand the current prey behavior. Um, so we have some colleagues that work with birds. They went out in the field and collected us pellets from different predator birds in order to understand dietary and how this both is connected to each other. So after we understand this better, obviously, we have a better understanding about the ecological niches today uh, and how they change. So with that knowledge, we will move on to eventually reconstruct the past ecological niches and what implication it has on hominins. But with once that is done in the next what, five years, we want to use both the current understanding and the past understanding in order to work on um, uh, conservation strategies for the future, since the Caucasus area is a very uh, a diverse region and a, a considered a hotspot for a lot of endemic species. So here I brought some pictures from our colleagues. Um, we already found um, the Eurasian eagle owl, the common kestrel, long eared owl, and the little owl. And that's just around Arad Cave. We now moved on to Calavan 2 and Hof, and we are now waiting for more results. So when we go there on our field trip in uh, June, um, June, July, I hope that we uh, already have more information than just uh, a taxonomic list of each uh, site. Um, so yeah, I think um, to, to sum up basically what the plan is, is to understand um, uh, the population dynamics of humans and fauna through time. Um, I want to create a modern analog database of microfauna um, that can serve uh, for future studies of past ecological oscillations. This will also include uh, hopefully a very detailed bone reference collection for everyone else who will work on uh, um, uh, archaeozoology in that area and yeah at the end of the day even though I'm uh, drifting <laughs> more to ecology at this point um, uh, I have to keep in mind how this is connected to life ways and mobility of past hunter gatherers and um, about long-term processes connected to that um, I hope I was not too fast um, thank you very much and uh, Hopefully there are some questions. Um, 
One of the things I noticed, and I don't know if you can necessarily answer this question right now, um, is that you have Oh, you have a higher diversity in your cave sites in comparison to your open air sites. And I just wondered if you could, again, speculate or hypothesize on why that may be the case. Is it down to preservation or is it down to maybe some other environmental factor? Um, so for now, I think it will be preservation, to be honest. Like usually in caves, um, we have this picture of, let's say, um, an owl living actually in the cave. So everything it will drop, it will accumulate there. Um, while in an open air site, I think there is much more activity going on. As I said, in Calavan, it's like encompassed by two rivers as well, which then influence um, with the flooding this area. Um, but maybe I'm wrong, you know, maybe there is a um, uh, another problem with those sites, but for now I think it's um, just preservation and also like um, maybe sampling or something going on. Like I'm not really sure what they did in half, but you know, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Fab. Um, and I think um, the results in Park are going to be really cool because you you have through the sequence there basically a you know the the, the faunal assemblages going from you know, all through the last glacial period. So you're going mm. to maybe, hopefully, it would be really cool if you could pick out different sort of suborbital climatic fluctuations within mm. your mammalian assemblage, which um, especially as we know, kind of the biomes are shifting, you know, very yeah, rapidly yeah, yeah. in the region, if, if that's also sort of picked up in the, in the fauna as well. Mm. Definitely, yeah. yeah. That'd be awesome. Okay. Thank you, Dominic. Uh, we'll move on to our third speaker. So that's going to be Yakov Mamadov, if I'm saying that correctly, if you're here. Hello. Oh, hello. Hi. Hello. Hi. Hi. I'm just going to introduce you first, and then if you're happy to share your slides. Yes. Yep. Okay. So um, our final speaker today, as I said, is Dr. Yakov Mamadov, and he's from the Institute of Archaeology, Ethnography and Anthropology um, in the Institute of Geological Sciences in Azerbaijan. He also works at Khazar University. Um, Yakov has recently completed his PhD focusing on the settlement of the genus Homo in the Southern Caucasus, working with both archaeological and anthropological remains. Um, he's been working on a wide range of excavations across Azerbaijan, covering both the Paleolithic and also the Neolithic. And today, Jakob is going to discuss the developments of Paleolithic studies in Azerbaijan uh, during and since the Soviet era, highlighting some of the key archaeological sites in the region um, and what they mean for understanding hominin dispersal in the Caucasus. And he's going to then discuss plans for future work in this, this relatively understudied area. So if you're happy to share your screen. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, before beginning my speech with your permission, I'd like to remind my colleague PhD, Emil Skandar, who died a few days ago at a young age. Emil was uh, one of well-known experts uh, of Achaemenid period. He's untimely this suddenly Suddenly, everyone, may your soul be happy. Uh, research we, uh, which were carried out uh, at Udavna at Falls, yes, uh, 20th century, led to approach region as an evaluation zone. This fact uh, provided by the remains discovered in the 1939 at the Eldar Lowland Center of Udavna near Cheshishche Karaji Monastery Complex as a result of investigation on the tools remains. Uh, from Udavna Pitex, it's evidence that extinct hominid or hominidae had existed in the southern Caucasus during the same period, nearly nine and eight uh, million years ago. According to the concept of uh, whole migration of uh, home from Africa, they spread to the Middle East and the Arabian Peninsula, which uh, via the Caucasus period approximately two million years ago. There was a favorable climate in the region for this. Uh, during the early Pleistocene, the region was dominated by lowlands, mountains, 
uh, and the warmer climate than today uh, had been favorable to settlement and uh, of the founders of pebble, of, uh, pebble stone culture. The average temperature was three, uh, five degrees Celsius in January and 28 uh, in June. Uh, and the average annual rainfall was 1.5 uh, millimeter in the region was with uh, flora and fauna. At the early Pleistocene, the western shores of Caspian Sea reached the low reaches of the Aztafatsai. The study of Paleolithic, uh, Paleolithic period in Azerbaijan began in the 5th uh, of the 20th uh, century. We can divide this research into two periods, the period of Soviet rule and the years of independence. So far, eight caves and more than 20 open Paleolithic camps have been explored. The founder of Azerbaijan Public Study uh, had been Professor Senov, and the most of his research is, uh, this is just connected with his name. Professor Senov and uh, uh, Mansurov, Chafarov, Azeinolov are also represented with this school. Research which were carried out in a zip cave under the supervision of uh, Seno first time showed images of early homogeneous at early uh, Pleistocene epoch in region. Uh, a zip Paleolithic cave uh, was registered in 1960 by the Paleolithic Archaeological Expedition of uh, Azerbaijan National Science in Karabakh region in the uh, 16 kilometer Frizoli city between the villages of Azakh and Salakat. The cave, uh, cave located on the left bank of the Kuruchai, uh, 950 meters above the sea level. Archaeological excavation carried out in 1906 uh, and 1982 on the southern entrance road of the Azak cave and in the first hole. Ten archaeological strata have been identified. Artifacts uh, of pebble stone culture of the one discovered during archaeological excavations in layers 7 and 10 in 1974 and 1984 uh, belonging to the first stage of occupation in the cave. Artifacts from layer 7 and 10 of the other cave give simple amorphous and archaic effects uh, than the technical complex of first layer of all the ones. This may be to the fact that the early people in the region began to live according with the environment in the, which they found themselves and uh, to master the technical and the principles relevant to the new natural condition, which uh, the radical different from the technical ones. In the seventh and the tenth layer of the cave, local raw materials, parties, rock fragments were used. Uh, pebble stone is rare. The base uh, of tools obtained from the layer is made by grinding the one end of the rock and the conglomerate tubes uh, of both sides. Systematic development the tools are unique. Small cracks are formed in the corner of the large stone balls and the sides uh, of the face. Uh, small tools or in corner. In suggestions that uh, seven and tenth layer belong to different archaeological cultures than the upper layer of classical older one, depending on the color, composition, and the condition of surface and the named Kuruchai uh, archaeological culture. One of the reasons for new cultural uh, uh, was to hand the chopper gentilized by it. To four and four point five kilogram, which we say of cold. So, in general, three such two uh, tools were found in seven, uh, eight layer of the cave. However, some of his opponents believe that discovery only a few uh, choppers on the only one side didn't just write to a separate culture. This culture isn't limited in the Kurchai Valley in. Uh, 12, uh, 2012 and 2021 research, which uh, were carried out under the supervision of Zeno at Karaja Paralytic site, which created at the Mikashore Reserve, as well as research in Central Dagestan, Ayn Cup 1, Demokai 1, and Demokai 2, led to chain full information about spreading area of this culture and the emergency and the migration of its founders. It is the first time in Azerbaijan dated Paleolithic uh, that large two choppers weighing nearly four kilograms have been found in the Apsheron deposit in layers one million uh, years and the oldest. So early humans which migrate, migrated from uh, Africa to Eurasia settled in Azek cave approximately 1.8 and 
five million years ago, how our advanced form, the discovery tools, as well as geological surveys suggest that they've uh, settled in the region at least 1.9 and 2.1 million years ago. So uh, the result uh, of the investigation shows that early places on home on Erectus deep people spread the north of the uh, throat, the ancient settlement of Azuka and Karaza and the Daustan from there to the Asia. In the sixth layer, Azuk, in accordance with the change of physical type of people, they were changed in the composition of the tools, fragments became widespread. Layer five uh, of the cave, cave difference from the early Ashelian layer in meteorological composition, color sickness composition of archaeological materials. The stone materials are uh, five and six times less than the early Ashelian layer. layer. The low jawbone found in the cave as of, uh, in 1968 was investigated by Hazib and the Kasnova. Part of jawbone belongs to female age 20, 25. It belongs uh, to a circle of Homo heidelbergians, which transformed to the direction of Homo sapiens neanderthalis. Uh, geologically, it belongs to the middle race period. Archaeologically, it uh, belongs to the end of middle Ashelian culture. In my opinion, it is more appropriate uh, to call it as Homo Azekhensis. As a result of, uh, of archaeological excavation under the supervision of Mansro, uh, Paleolithic uh, cave camp Korgaya uh, for the first time in Souls of Great Caucasus uh, had been attested during the research conducted in the Korgaya 7 layer, uh, were identified, the obtained uh, uh, materials belong to the Ashelian. In 1930, research was started in Jamjimak rock shelter in Zakatala region, and the 1930 research was uh, started on Yastadash, located on the uh, northeast of Jamjimak, and the three layers were recorded. According to investigation conducted by Mansur along the right bank of the Kur River in 1978 and the 19. Uh, eight, uh, nine uh, open deep Paleolithic settlements of Karadus and Sarburun in 2008. the Paleolithic sites were recorded and uh, situated and studied. The stone products discovered during the archaeological excavation here belongs to the early Assyrian period from the technical and the morphological points of view. In the uh, early Ashelian period, people lived in the caves and open tips camps. The period uh, is characterized by initial experience in selection and nucleus percussion on the surface, making technique impact for the preparation of preparative materials and disease initial practical technical achievement. In addition, uh, systematic mapping and the fragments in the rare uh, cases remains slab preparative were found. Also, disc shaped uh, cores predominated in the middle Ashelian period. There are also multi shaped nucleus with a single impact surface and the two impact surface. Fragmentation in middle Ashelian was full formed in addition uh, to four fragments of the various uh, shapes. The method of obtained large and the medium sized slab, as well as triangular fragments, were Mastered, uh, this impact surface is smooth polished. In the second half of Middle Pleistocene and the second half of Upper Caspian geological uh, period, there was a global cooling in the, of the climate. Uh, glacier of uh, form of a, a part of the Les Caucasus, an attitude of 2,000 meters subalpine at uh, attitude 2,200 meters and upper borders of the forest uh, at uh, an attitude of 1,200 and 800 meters. Mustarian sites in the territory of Azerbaijan are divided into several groups. According to location, in the, it is, consists of Kurosaitra and the Salai Basin, uh, so, yeah, uh, we can see the uh, third layer of Azıq and the Tavlar, Azıq Basin, Kazma, uh, Talish Zor, Buzeir, Allah Zuban Chai, Caves, Hazan Su, Intesu, Rivas, Kayalı, Chakmakla, Uchusas, Chak, Chekil, Gader Dara, Kemerli, and Abdul Group Karabakh. During this period, massively elongated 
Slabs with six uh, smooth percussion fragments and the corresponding cores are found. There are no choppers, percussion tools, or hand choppers among the large tools. Tools from Mysterian period uh, are made of flint, shale, and desert, most of which uh, are flint and the shales. Uh, they use materials brought from nearby areas, uh, materials, uh, raw materials, which ex uh, the expectations of Neanderthal remains found in as a cave. All known uh, Neanderthal remains in the South Kafkas were obtained from the Middle Paleolithic settlements in of the Amaretia region. These uh, bones uh, are incompleted and have no sense of burial. The story of boundary between the Middle and the Upper Paleolithic in, uh, is about uh, 39,000 uh, years old. This result demonstrates that Neanderthal didn't spread to the west of the South Kafkas after the period, and uh, the, it confirms the concept of simultaneous extinction of Neanderthals in the uh, South Kafkas and as well as the uh, other regions of Europe. Upper Paleolithic specimens in the territory of Azerbaijan had been discovered in the Tamzile, Tar Lazar, Twansai Caves, Daya Arase camps, uh, as well as Yatakere and the open air sites in Surakhanum and in the Velash Saival uh, of Masal. Upper Paleolithic period in the territory of Azerbaijan dates to uh, back to 35 and 11,000 years ago. There are technical and typological similarities in the Upper Paleolithic. The complex of the Caucasus neighboring regions in the first stage of the Upper Paleolithic, the disk uh, was transformed to the prismatic core. Uh, mainly slabs and the trangeless fragments were used. During the period, uh, the slab, which was uh, the main form of the, of the fragment, became narrow, elongated, thinner in the cross section, and many very prepared with slab elements. In the second stage of Upper Paleolithic, the slab, which are mainly preparatory materials, became narrow, elongated, the cross changed the size, uh, shapes, uh, became thinner and take form of a prism. Uh, the pragmatic uh, fragments of the slab, like starting the, of this stage micro slab, have formed. No paleontological remains of uh, the upper Paleolithic have been found in Azerbaijan. Those our researches cover the entire territory of Azerbaijan geographically. Uh, chronically, it uh, indicates that uh, there was a settlement uh, from the earlier Pleistocene and uh, that the process was continued. In addition, we want to continue research in the Damzile and the Azakh uh, caves this year. It should be noted that research uh, in both caves will be conducted with our colleagues from other countries, uh, in particular experts from Turkey, uh, Russia, United Kingdom, uh, Denmark, and uh, Australia are expected to part in the uh, research in Azak. Uh, thank you. Oh, fab, that's great. Um, thank you, Yaga, for um, a, a whistle stop tour through the Paleolithic of um, Azerbaijan. Does anybody have any questions? Ah, yes, yeah, so we have a question in the chat from Elham. Um, thanks for the nice information and presentation. Do you have any plan to re-excavate Azok Cave? Yes, uh, we plan to continue research in Azok Cave this year uh, with the participation of experts from Turkey, Russia, United Kingdom, Denmark, uh, and Australia. Yep, that's great. Um, any other questions? So I have a question. One of the, the characteristics of our Paleolithic sites in Armenia is that a lot of the stone tools are made using obsidian. And I just wondered if, um, what are the kind of main raw materials used for the kind of stone tool production in your Azeri sites? Um, 
can I have the little bit the uh, assistant with the English? Yes, yeah, yeah, sure, yeah. Yaqub Məlim, anladınız sualı? Matris FM soruşur ki, Ermənistan'dan materiallardan istifadə olunubdur. Aha, obsidiyandan da daha çox. Ama mesela Azərbaycanda necədir daş məmulatlarının hazırlanması daha çox hansı məmulatlardandır? Mən o yuxarıda dedim, indi azıqda sizde deyim olarak. Esasen azıqda kaya materiallarından istifadə olunur. Raw materials. Rock materials. Sonraki dövrlerde ise flint var, saxmaq taşı var. Obsidian son mərhələdə olur. Orta pariyetin sonlarında da olur. Um, so, yes, yeah, so it's the mainly uh, in the latest stages, obsidian, but the, in the beginning, like, uh, let's say, the early stages is more flint and uh, the, the kind of a rock material, kind of, yeah, as a raw material. Yeah, uh, that's great. Thank you. Thank you, Nami, for, for translating. Thank you. And a round of applause or the round of applause emoji to our... Um, our three speakers today and thank you for taking uh, the time out to discuss the ongoing research and all the different diversity of palliate um, in the Southern Caucasus. Um, and yeah, thanks for the, 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 the Caucasus Network team for organising. I don't know if um, Gwen or Narmin want to say anything to wrap up the seminar. I just wanted to say thank you everyone for joining, uh, for taking the time and for your wonderful presentations and to you, Jenny, for moderating and doing such a great job. Um, we will get some food and I hope you will join future events. Um, if you, if any of you would like to present or have an idea for a seminar, um, feel free to email us. I will drop our email in the chat. Um, yeah, so you can just get in touch with us.